so operations manager for Ticker Live Wiki. Um, and uh, this is a little outside of my comfort zone. I'm not usually a public speaker. Um, I'm more of kind of like a boots on the ground and working with a team type of guy. So uh, just be patient with me in my presentation, and I'll probably be able to this. But uh, thanks for coming out today to hear me speak. Um, so, Tikoro Wai Oiki, our aim is to restore our island bird song together and to create the first uh, predator free urban island. Tikoro uh, Wai Oiki is a community vision, um, and Tikoro Wai uh, translate, translates to the cloak of Oiki. Korowai is a traditional cloak usually protect, protecting something of significance. Uh, this one will belong to the island itself. Korowai is made of weaving threads together, which is reflected the many people and organizations involved to come together in the program, working together towards a shared aim. Wiki has a really great history of environmentalism, and the first kind of um, successful uh, eradication actually happened uh, on Maria Island in 1960, and this was organized by a school teacher and his students um, from Wiki Island. Um, <clears throat> this project uh, that we are working on together has uh, been founded on decades of predator control, um, and more than 60% of the island inhabitants um, participate in, uh, control, in controlling predators, and there are close to 1,000 volunteers um, participating in the community groups on the island. Uh, this map shows where Wiki sits in the Haraki Gulf Marine Park. Um, it's right on the Seabird Superhighway, stretching from the Coromandel Peninsula to mainland Auckland. Um, it's the second largest uh, island in the Haraki Gulf, just followed by Altea. Um, <clears throat> and it's also the, um, there is exciting possibilities for the biodiversity gains uh, from the program that we're working on. Um, Seabirds require uh, safe breeding sites as well, so it's not just our um, forest birds that need this protection, it's also the seabirds as well. And we have lots of um, breeding and nesting seabirds along the coast. Um, so this uh, project is both a terrestrial and a marine um, protection project. Um, since Maria Island um, was successful more than 60 years ago, there's been 100 eradications that have been completed. Um, and Wiki Island is surrounded by lots of predator-free islands. So the uh, light green, um, the light green uh, islands that you see there, those are already islands surrounding us that are predator free. Um, so actually, 44 out of the 50 islands in the Haraki Gulf are already predator free. Um, so it's really important that we kind of um, attain that goal as well. Um, it um, it'll give us the opportunity to um, kind of prevent predators that are living on Hiki Island from uh, uh, invading some of the islands around us but then also it'll be uh, easier to kind of keep it uh, in that status once we kind of get to that point. So on Wiki Island, we have, a, um, the population's gone up a little bit since I made this slide, but, uh, we have about 9,200 residents, um, and about 65% of the uh, population is uh, live there full time. There are about another 35% that are part-time residents, and people just come over for holiday homes, um, but it swells more to more than 50,000 people um, on a busy summer day um, living on the island. Um, we also receive about 1 million tourists a year. Um, so it's really important we kind of communicate these messages to all these people um, that are coming to the Hiki Island. Um, more than 60% of the people that live on the island um, do, um, are involved in community projects controlling um, predators. Um, we have about 1,000 volunteers and community groups just not doing backyard control, but just some community groups um, that are working on uh, controlling and uh, eradicating predators. Uh, there's about 98% uh, support of the project, so we have lots of different, lots of support from people uh, living on Wahiki, so it's a really great opportunity um, to um, work on, to do this maki on the island. Uh, it is a people project, um, so people are at the center, and they're our biggest challenge, but also our biggest opportunity um, when this project is going through. Um, some of the things that they contribute with is reporting stove sightings, uh, donating rabbit for bait, um, providing goods and services pro bono, such as communication and legal advice, 
Um, so the, their work really leads to um, a big difference for the project. Um, on the island itself, there's a wide variety of habitats, including uh, coastal forests, inland forests, regenerating forests, wetlands, rural areas, um, uh, both pasture and horticulture. Uh, we have urban areas as well. Um, and you can kind of get a feel of the, the amount of private land on the island. Um, so that's the, all the uncolored um, uh, uh, land that you see, but there's also a lot of uh, Auckland Council land, uh, dock land, and other reserves on the island as well. Um, we use a custom uh, CRM, so kind of customer relationship management tool, to manage all the data regarding these landowners. Um, so this is kind of like land access uh, with gate codes, um, contact information for those landowners, so uh, mobile numbers and tele uh, emails so you can kind of communicate to them. Because um, it is really important that we kind of, uh, again, kind of bring these people along, these landowners along with us on this journey. Um, so it's really important, yeah, so it's really important we, um, we do that. Uh, this is a multi-species, multi-year project. So kind of like um, managing all these people's information is really important to the project. Um, so what happens once you get funding for the eradication? How do you translate a community vision and a, a very passionate community um, into an operational eradication program? Uh, kind of once your governance entity is set up, um, one of the, the, uh, a lot of the community just wants you to get out and start tracking. Um, but there's lots of things to set up before you can do that. Um, so you need to kind of like really set up your data management system so when you're out there tracking, you're able to collect all this data um, and just communicate this data to um, your team and also the community as well. Um, so it's really important to set up that data, data management system before you get started. Um, and it's also important to, to plan. Um, so really spend that time to have a strong operational plan before you get started. Um, and um, really kind of um, work with those relationships and permissions from every landowner and partner um, who owns and manages the land that we will be working on. Um, it's important to have the eradication mindset. So um, during this project, we are trying to target um, every, single, every single step. Um, so you really have to make sure that um, you kind of have this mo the mindset of making sure that um, every single trap set is in perfect condition um, for the project. Um, and it's also important to, um, to manage that data coming in properly. Um, so the, um, the eradication project, um, so we were op operational in February of 2020. Um, but the project actually started in um, 2018 with getting everything set up. Um, when, the first project, when the project first started, we were unsure if we had any other uh, mussels on the island. We knew we had stoats, but we weren't sure if we had ferrets and weasels. Um, since the project has been going on, we haven't caught any weasels or ferrets in our uh, network of DOT 200s. So we can pretty confidently say that um, we are only dealing with stoats on the Hiki Island. Um, so it does make it an uh, advantage that we're only dealing with one of the, the muscular species. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, yeah, so I should mention that uh, we have about 1,600 DOC 200s um, across the network, which works about to one trap every five and a half hectares. Um, and the other thing that we're um, working on is we're still in the eradication phase. Um, so we're still trying to catch these last scopes. But once we do catch the last scope, um, we still have to do a two-year monitoring plan um, to make sure that there aren't any scopes that we've missed on the island as well. Um, so, as well as the indirect support for the project, the community are really involved in this project. project. Uh, just over 60% of the traps are, monitored, or are managed by Tukurwai and Wahiki staff. Um, the rest are managed by a range of private staff, contractors, volunteers, um, including some staff from large farms, contractors, and volunteers. Um, this is really a community project um, that we're working on. Um, and there's also a regional park with staff and volunteers um, for that park as well. Um, so we really have to make sure that all everybody's on the same page. We have lots of different um, people working on this eradication project. So it's really important that we kind of communicate to these people, share the data with them, and make sure that we're all working towards that common goal. 
Um, so each of these dots on this map represent a trap. Um, so you can kind of see the 1,600 traps um, across the network. Um, so we re really rely on the DOC 200 traps. We use a mix of single set and double set DOC 200s. Um, and each of the, it'll be a little bit hard to tell on the, the slide, but each of these set of dots represents a different delivery partner. Um, so again, there's different community groups on the island, our own trackers, uh, local EWI, um, and volunteers, farmhands, all working together on this. Um, the little halos around those um, center dots, those just kind of let me know as, a, um, uh, as the organizer uh, which ones still need to be done in this trap run. So for our, um, for our traps during the winter, we're servicing those traps every three weeks. Um, during the kind of like shoulder seasons, the spring and autumn, at that point in time, uh, so like right now, we're servicing those traps every two weeks. Um, we're rebating them with fresh rabbit and real egg. Um, but the other thing that we're doing, so kind of like during the um, denning and dispersal season, so that's kind of like from uh, October until uh, February, um, some of those traps we're checking weekly. Uh, and if we're actually able to catch a juvenile scout or a lactating female, we will check those traps daily after that. Um, we'll also infill um, our traps in the network with alternative traps. So if we have scope sightings or pickups on our trail cameras, we will infill with both alternative traps. And that's a mixture of um, different live traps, um, so mostly Holdens and Edgars, um, uh, cat cage traps. Then we'll also use um, good nature traps as well as just something as an alternative. Um, if they're used to our just normal um, trap boxes, we'll kind of give them alternatives to kind of go into as well. Um, the team has to be very flexible to accommodate, accommodate the different needs and approaches. We have to find ways to ensure um, the delivery standard is uh, consistent across the entire island um, with a robust data management system. Um, and this really helps us kind of uh, uh, retain all this um, amazing data. Um, all staff and most contractors um, and volunteers use um, ArcGIS field maps to record their data in the field. Um, there's a few volunteers that use TrackNZ, um, and this is some of the community groups that started uh, prior to this project starting, so they already had their data management system, a lot of their data in TrackNZ. Um, we were uh, able to let TrackNZ communicate with our ArcGIS system, and so those seamlessly can kind of communicate back and forth, and so we can kind of upload their data into our system, and all this data is available to us um, real time. So um, if this was the actual dashboard, you'd be able to see those um, halos turning green as trappers are checking them in the field. So it's really great um, to help us kind of keep track of where people are in the field as well. Um, there's a handful of volunteers and farm hands that are a little bit less tech savvy, um, and they are entering their data into like Excel sheets or just basically sending them, clicking me a text and saying that they checked their traps. Um, we're just going to reach this sort of agreement with them that they're sending them their data within like a week of when they're collecting it. So it's a little bit slower in the real time, um, but it's still good to get that data, and we still have that data um, pretty soon after they collect it. <clears throat> so we have the, the customized uh, ArcGIS system um, and data management system that was created to allow us to um, create a, our CRM so to kind of monitor or to keep track of all of the landowners um, and operational aspects of the, um, the STEP eradication program were recorded in one central database. So all this data that we are collecting is um, in one location. Um, the system includes data as wide ranging as scout sightings, um, and then some of the outcome monitoring that we do, so like five minute bird counts. Um, and then we also keep track of uh, trap maintenance records as well, so when we do our trap audits, we keep track of all that information in there as well. Um, and also safe and, uh, health and safety incidents as well. Um, so you can kind of see trends in the data with stokes and where you're catching them. You can also see uh, trends in health and safety incidents as well. So we can kind of adapt as we go along with health and safety, which is very important to kind of keep uh, all our trackers healthy and safe um, when they're working out in the field. Um, yeah, and also we currently do not have county dieback on the island, so it's able to, uh, we also keep track of where the county forests are. Um, so we're able to kind of keep track and make special, um, like make the tracker aware when they're going into areas um, with county forests. Um, so I just want to point out one thing um, real quick. Um, you'll notice that um, underneath the, the trap catch data, 
um, that it says trap services instead of trap chats. And that's something that we really want to instill to the, to the team, um, is they're not just checking the trap, they're not just going over there, um, picking out a piece of rabbit and chucking out the fresh egg and just putting the new, bait, the new lure into there. They should be doing a mini audit every time they go to each and every trap. Um, so they should be kind of like looking at that trap um, and making sure that it's in pristine condition um, so uh, when the scope approaches the trap, that um, it, does, it goes into the trap. Because at this point in the project, um, we aren't targeting just any old scope, we're targeting the choosiest and choosiest scopes. So it's really important to have that, that mindset for the team. So we kind of, we stop referring them to these trap checks, we just refer to these trap services now. Um, by now, I think we're up to about 140,000 trap services since the project started. Um, I think that the number increased to actually 181 scopes. Um, our most recent scope catch um, was a female, um, and she was caught just near the Thurgood Bay's bench a weekend before. She was caught on the west end of the island, uh, just south of Matia Tia. And uh, for that one, we actually did a, a dissection, and we were able to kind of see that it did have. Uh, that female um, was pregnant, and we did find some embryos in there, um, and so it was really kind of interesting to kind of see that. Um, all the stoats we collect um, are sent to Dr. Andrew Veal, who you'll hear a little bit later today, um, and they're sent away for genetic analysis. Um, this information helps us in multiple ways. Um, one of the ways is that um, we're able to kind of uh, determine, uh, get a rough estimate of the number of breeding females still left on the island, so we'll show you later um, today uh, how we can make the family groups with the scopes that we catch. So we can kind of determine uh, which female gave birth to which juveniles and come up with an estimate of the number of breeding females to left on the island. I think the rough, uh, rough estimate that we had from the previous year is we had anywhere from two to four breeding females still left on the island. Um, the thing is, if you miss one, one female, then and we have to start all over. So it's really important that we target those, um, those scouts. Um, so that's why when we do catch those juvenile scouts, um, we'll go out there um, and check those traps daily in that area, because a lot of times those siblings will follow them um, into the trap. Um, so it's really important to kind of like do those daily checks to clear those out, so we can kind of catch all the juveniles from each litter. I think um, in one of the litters we caught um, seven different juveniles from the same litter, and in another one we caught five. Um, as well, we caught both of the, the females um, that gave birth to those others, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, yeah. um, so this is a scope catch heat map. Um, the white dots on the map are indicating the uh, location of a scope sighting. Um, so you'll notice most of those scope sightings are on the, um, the west end of the island, and that's mostly because that's where most of the people live. So that's mostly where our, um, our eyes are, and that's mostly where the people are reporting the scope sightings. Um, and we do respond to every single scope sighting that comes in, um, and our level of effort to respond to the scope sighting just depends on the validity of the um, scope sighting. So every single person that comes in and uh, either calls our 0800 number or fills out the form on the website, I'll give them a quick call and record that scope sighting um, in um, survey one, two, three. Um, and it's not that I'm kind of like grilling them with questions about um, what, you know, about that uh, scope sighting. It's more of a conversation. And it's really, um, it's really a great opportunity to kind of um, let them know more about the project. And if they describe the scope, if we had one of our more recent scope sightings, somebody called me up and said they saw a, a large black scope um, crossing the road. And um, it doesn't really sound like a scope to me. Um, so we're kind of, um, kind of like talking to other people in the area, we found out that there was a litter of kittens born in the area, which we think is probably a kitten instead of a stoat. We still want to make sure that um, we do respond because um, to that sighting. So we put out trail cameras um, in that area, and we actually did pick up a large, or not a large, but a small black cat picked up on the trail camera, so we kind of feel confidently that um, that, that was probably a cat and not a stoat. Um, we still want to confirm that because we are at such low numbers, so we do have to take every scope setting seriously. Um, and the other thing you kind of notice is um, the scope catches are pretty spread out across the island. But we do have a really high concentration of scope catches um, near waterways. So it kind of varies slightly, but between 90 and 95 percent of our um, scope catches are within um, 100 meters of the coast or a waterway across the island. Um, 
so looking at this, so again, it's really important to kind of record this data in accurate locations of your, uh, of your traps. We were able to pull this information out. So I think we had a lot of anecdotal evidence from our trappers on the island saying that they kind of noticed that, you know, oh, it seems like I'm catching a lot more stoats in like, these areas around the coast or like around this wetland. Um, and it's important to kind of like to listen to that and kind of like confirm that you can kind of adjust um, your, um, the way you're going about things and going forward. So that's again, that's why we're checking all those traps um, within 100 meters of the waterways once every week. Um, during the summer. Um, so this is um, an interesting slide. So we do um, we do work with um, detection dogs on the island as well. Um, so these are all the um, stoat dog tracks from the different visits on Hiki Island. Um, so the kind of like the what we call that blue the bluish um, tracks. Those are from scat scent dogs, um, and so those are the ones that. Um, we're specifically looking for um, for stoat scat. So I don't know if um, people are familiar with um, Brad and his dog Guido, uh, but they've come to the island a few times um, to, to help us out. Um, and we also have the maroon um, colored track lines, and those are areas that the scent dogs have gone to. Um, and then the different circles um, uh, represent different indications, so whether it be like a scat found or one of the scent dogs indicating um, the area. Um, we do have a uh, a stoat dog in training currently, um, so we do, that's a really valuable tool that we found that helps us kind of uh, determine what areas to target for these alternative traps, because um, we have to be very specific when it comes to those and try to find those lines in the bush where we're learning to actually have stoat settings. Um, so this slide here, here kind of like shows all this data coming together and the importance of this data, um, this data being collected. Um, so uh, previously we had Andrew Veal indicate that there was a, so this is kind of like the Rangi Hoa area, kind of near the golf course, if anybody's familiar with Miki Island. Um, Andrew Veal had indicated this was an area of interest for us based on stoke genetic data. He had determined that we had um, caught some of the juveniles in the Aden, from Aden in this area in the um, spring, early, or late spring, early summer, um, but we had not caught the, uh, the female or the male um, that had uh, that were from that uh, female's juveniles. So we decided that it would be a good place to send the dogs. So again, you see those same kind of um, uh, trails from the detection dogs. And so we had four dogs spend three days area looking for this, in this area for scent and scat. Um, they did indicate in um, a few different areas around there. So right on Guido's dog, they found two different small scats. Uh, we, had, we also had a scent dog indicate on a wood pile. Um, trail cameras were deployed at that, book at that log pile um, where that dog indicated that. Um, you can't see it very well. There's a little tiny stoat um, on that wood pile up there. Um, so we did kind of um, find that, the, um, that there was a stoat kind of like hanging out in that wood pile where that dog indicated that. Um, and after that, we added uh, additional live traps. We added um, holding traps. Uh, we also added an Edgar trap with a sound cooler in it with um, juvenile stoke noises. <laughs> and we actually dragged uh, a dead uh, female stoke over the trap, through the traps, through the bush, all over there to create scent trails, kind of like leading to that area. Um, and then it was after we dragged that dead stoke that we caught the, um, this stoke. Um, this is kind of a, a famous stoke. So this is, um, his name is uh, Mr. Wahiki, um, and he's actually traveled down to Wenaki Fenua um, in Lincoln. Um, he's actually used in seeing how um, trap shy individuals interact with um, traps. Um, and Andrews told me that he is the most leery and most, most neophobic of all the stoats they have in captivity. So he's really been really helpful um, to the project and understanding how different um, uh, individuals um, that are kind of uh, trap shy interact with um, different lures um, and different traps. So it's, it's a very valuable catch. A huge effort. <laughs> Um, data. <laughs> um, it's important to collect as much data as you can. If you don't know um, exactly what you're going to be, what information you'll need to know a little bit later on in the project. Um, so we're able to adjust trapping techniques, change rules out, uh, uh, adjust trap schedules as we see trends in the data. Um, and we're also, again, able to confirm anecdotal uh, evidence that the trappers um, talk to us about. Um, and one of those instances is when I first started with the project, so I uh, wasn't there when I first started. 
Um, but when I joined in October of um, 2020, one of the trappers told me, he said, Frank, he's like, I don't, he was like, uh, and the rays do work in some areas, but he was just like, he told me, he's like, I don't think the rays are working for us. And so we did kind of like do like a, a small kind of like break around the Christmas time where we um, didn't check the traps as frequently. I think it was like once every three weeks during that time, so we could give people a small break. Um, but I noticed that, and I looked at the, what he told me, I looked at the trap run before we put the arrays in, we caught three stokes. The trap run we had the arrays in, we caught zero stokes. And the trap run after that, we caught four stokes. So to me, um, I think the arrays can work, but on Hiki Island, because we are a warmer, humid climate, I think that those, um, that those arrays don't work for us. They kind of get moldy a little bit faster. So just having that fresh rabbit is, is really key for us. We've kind of moved away from the arrays. We did use in our first winter as well. Um, we've just incre increased the frequency of our trap checks um, just so we can um, uh, have that more desirable rate in the traps. Um, and then we can also analyze the different traps, which ones are most effective. So we always look at the percentage of the um, traps that are in the network um, and what percentage of the trap uh, stokes they catch. Um, I think the most effective ones that we found so far are the, the double uh, double entry run throughs um, for our normal dot two hundred traps, um, which is kind of like what everybody um, everybody says. Um, but then for our live traps, I was really surprised by this. But the the Holden kind of like yellow plastic live traps have been really effective for us. Um, and that's kind of like as far as our alternative traps, it's been um, the the live trap that's caught the most stokes. Um, so it's important to kind of bring along uh, everybody along the journey. So it's important to share all this data that you're collecting and uh, let the community know and the trappers know um, the importance of collecting it. Because if they don't understand the importance, then um, you, you won't get the quality data, you won't get it in um, soon enough, and they just don't understand, uh, they won't record it accurately. Um, so for the project, we send out um, weekly operation uh, memos to all the different trappers and a lot of the people involved in the project. So in that weekly operations memo, we'll talk to them about updates in um, lure changes and when they should be checking for servicing their traps. Um, and uh, we also, so then the most recent one we came put out, um, all the different trappers are going to be putting stick bedding in their traps. So we found that as an effective lure. Very hot commodity and hard to come by. Um, we have found that um, that is a really effective lure for us. So then we're going to be putting that in all of our traps going, uh, coming up. Um, and then we also think we kind of like input information in there about um, trap sighting, or sorry, uh, stoke sightings. Um, so we kind of keep everybody uh, aware of where um, to kind of keep their eyes out uh, for uh, stokes and things like that as well. Um, and we also kind of talk about the stoke catches, share data with them about the the weight and the size of the stoke, the, if it's male or female, and then just the approximate age of the stoke. It's a little bit easier to tell those things in the springtime if it's a juvenile or adult. We share all this information with them. Um, we also have quarterly operational meetings um, where we usually bring in a guest speaker. And so in that bottom left-hand corner, that was when Andrew Veal came and talked to, talked to the teams and shared um, uh, with our team the, the stoke genetic data that he collects. So it was really, um, it was really great to kind of like share all this information that we're collecting to all the people doing a lot here on the ground. Um, we also bring people in to um, just kind of uh, teach different people about different aspects of the projects. We kind of bring different speakers in when we have those uh, ops meetings. Um, it's really important to the success of the of the project. Um, for the property owners, it's really important to share this information with them as well. So they're allowing us access to their private land to service these traps. Um, so we usually send out um, memos to them on a quarterly basis as well. Include a little bit of additional information that's in the, um, just in our general, generic, not generic, but general um, newsletter. Um, and just kind of let them know about more of like the trapping intricacies that um, they'd be um, more inclined to, um, to know about. Um, one of the big uh, campaigns that we started um, this previous springtime was our stoke sighting campaign, which has been extremely successful. Um, it not only gets the word out about the program, but also it allows us to respond uh, to the stoke sightings. Um, this past springtime, we talked to numerous schools, um, community groups, and business groups across the island, and in most of those um, talks resulted in a stoke setting. We had 
anywhere from teachers to bus drivers to uh, local taxi companies and wine tour associations come and report stoke sightings. So it's really great to kind of like let them know about the project, but let them know about the importance of reporting the stoke sightings. Um, kind of communicating what point of the project you're in as well. Um, so a lot of people heard about the project kicking off in 2020, but it's important to kind of tell them where we're at in the project now. Um, and during that kind of uh, denning and dispersal season, um, it really was effective and about 50% of the stoke settings that came in resulted in the stoke capture. Um, we always kind of communicate to them afterwards um, that we caught a stoke. We never tell them it's the same stoke that they saw because they do move quite large distances. We always tell them that increased effort from their stoke sighting, um, when it does happen, that results in a stoke catch and kind of gets everybody really, really excited as well. Um, and it's really important to, to analyze the data, but you also need to share it with everyone. Bring people, again, bring people along for the journey. Um, I think one of my most favorite things is um, uh, me and my partner, we're both in the wine industry, um, and there was a winemaker on the island. He never asks me about wine. He always asks me about stokes. He's just always really excited about the stoke project. And you know, when he hears about a stoke setting in his area, he's always kind of the first to kind of like, you know, see if we can do anything extra or what he can do to help out. So it's really important to kind of bring those landowners along on that journey and do outreach for the project. Um, so in the upper right hand corner, um, you'll see in that one that's Tim Lovegrove. So we brought him to the island to do um, to teach our team how to do five minute bird counts. But we also extended that um, training to um, the different various groups on the island. Um, so he did a lot of outreach to the islands. We taught people um, how to identify different bird calls um, and uh, to be able to kind of like do the, the five minute bird counts on the island as well. So kind of like sharing these resources with the people that are on the, on the boat. Um, in the bottom corner, um, we're measuring uh, stoke skulls. We're kind of getting an idea of stoke age by measuring stoke skulls. So again, it may seem kind of like very um, uh, boring, but we do have a lot of people that are excited about these things. And so we allow people to come in and kind of like learn how to like age stokes. So we have quite a few people that came in. I was really surprised by that. But um, yeah, we had uh, Dr. Elaine Murphy come in and talk to us um, about the um, about the uh, measuring stoke skulls. Um, we have this little uh, cake up there. So that was a cake that was baked um, by one of our staff members, and they were really excited when we got to 100,000 track services in the project. So you can kind of see those boots uh, on the cake and then the little stoats. Um, and it, it was just something that they were just really excited that, like, the amount of kilometers that we walked to kind of put in all that work um, and then just bake the cake that day when we kind of reached that point. And it's really great just to share that with the team. Um, so that gets to most of my, um, about my talk about stokes. Uh, I'm briefly going to talk about rats, so we are kind of like um, uh, investigating the um, rat side of the, the project, doing, um, see if we can eradicate rats um, on Hiki Island. Um, so we're just starting that project and doing some, um, uh, we're doing some work on that now to see if we can do an island-wide rat eradication. So the, um, the first trial we did, um, was kind of like at Kennedy Point. Um, so this is where the, the car ferry comes in if you're familiar with um, the, the project. Um, and the one thing that we kind of learned with, the, um, with this project is we, um, the southern half of that peninsula um, was, uh, there was a victor trap one every 25 meters across that area. Um, and in that area, and then on the top of that, you'll see a little band on the top. And in that area was our buffer area where we had bait stations in that area with, um, with uh, different color uh, glow-in-the-dark bait. So we can kind of see if the, the rats were kind of like um, coming through that area and being caught in those victor traps. Um, and it proved to us that the, um, the victor traps were a very effective um, control tool, um, but they didn't eradicate the rats in that area. Um, other things we learned from this project was that the, um, the uh, cliffs in that area were very difficult to work on <laughs> when it comes to um, putting out um, bait stations and um, trap stations. Um, and we also found out that the um, rats are breeding all year round on the um, The other uh, trial that we did that, uh, this is previous winter, so winter of 2022, was seeing that if we could eradicate um, rodents by using um, just bait. Um, so we used the in the traps. 
Um, for the core, which is the yellow area, in that area we have a bait station again every 25 meters. Um, and then we have the buffer area in that light blue area around that. And again, a uh, bait station every 25 meters. Um, and uh, I think it was after six weeks, we had no bait in tank in the core. Um, so we put out heaps of monitoring devices after that, so two cards, wax blocks, uh, trail cameras, everything like that, and we didn't um, see. We had two incursions um, in that area, um, and that was because the tip was included in that yellow area as well, and so then it was people kind of, um, where we had rats kind of like brought into the tip. Um, it was really interesting because we could see those rats that interact with every single bait station um, that they came to right when they got to the tip, and they were kind of, they, um, yeah, we didn't see a map of that, so they kind of, we did have two incursions in that area, but it was really interesting. Um, the other really cool thing that we had in that area, in that yellow area, is we had mangroves. Um, so uh, one of the uh, very kind of like MacGyver-ish people that we had on our team, uh, Phil, he designed um, floating bait stations to kind of go up and down the tide um, in that area as well. I'll show you a picture of that. So these are the floating bait stations that he designed. Um, and the really kind of like amazing thing about these floating bait stations, made with all recycled materials. Um, so the, the bamboo was just kind of like harvested from the island. Um, the plywood in that picture uh, was something that uh, he had found at the tip. Um, and then it was just old plastic milk jugs that kind of floated up and down with the tide. Um, and then there was old PVC that we had from the previous um, little experiment that we did that he repurposed um, to use to make those floating bait stations. Um, so I think it was that only after a few weeks that we had no more bait um, take from there. But we did have some rats um, kind of like who uh, going through the mangrove of trees and hopping onto those bait stations and um, taking that bait, so really kind of cool. Um, and this is the, um, the, the trial that's going on right now in Onoroa. So Onoroa is the, the main um, town on the island, um, and then they're currently doing a similar study with bait stations over 25 meters in that core area, and they have the, the buffer area, um, the yellow on the edges. Um, so that trial is currently going on, and um, yeah, we're still kind of collecting lots of data. So again, you can kind of see with all those big stations, there's heaps of amount of data. Um, those big stations are being serviced at once every week, um, just putting out um, the new fresh bait. So there's heaps and heaps and heaps of data when it comes to all this. It's really important to kind of manage your data. Um, but it's all about the results. Um, so it's really amazing. So that again, we mentioned before, but I I grew up in Michigan, and we don't have any parrots in Michigan. So when I first moved to Wiki Island, and I heard that we have parrots living on Wiki Island, I was just I couldn't believe it. So I was just kind of um, going through the bush and trying to find these caca, you know. And it was really difficult for me to see them initially, and it took me like um, a few tries to actually see them. But now they're everywhere. You know, every single morning I hear them roosting just outside of my house. And every time I hear them kind of like waking up, I'm just thinking to myself, they're saying thank you to all these people that are putting, you know, all this hard work. And you know, they speak really loud at five in the morning, but still they're saying thank you. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's really cool to kind of like to hear them say thank you to the, the team that's putting this maki. Um, we've also seen Korimaku um, come back to the island as well. They've just been kind of um, reintroduced themselves. Um, and there's been sightings and um, different people that have heard of those. And Kakariki as well. Um, so I'm really trying hard to see Kakariki on the island. I haven't seen them yet, but there has been photographic evidence of them being there. So there was um, somebody's gone out and taken pictures of them. Um, there's been a few different people that have heard them on the island as well. So it's really exciting to kind of see these native birds um, just thriving on the Motu. And we have the opportunity of so many other different bird species to come back to Ahiki. We have all these predator-free islands around us. And so if we can kind of um, get to that point where we eradicate stoats and rats on the island, we have a really great opportunity for all, of them, all these different birds to, to um, reintroduce themselves. Um, so this is, uh, again, this is a photo of uh, Alistair McDonald. So he's that ex uh, Hiki school teacher who recently passed away, unfortunately. But he was reunited with two of his students um, that uh, were, were part of that um, eradication on that island all those years ago. Um, he's still really excited um, about what he did and the legacy that he left 
And I think we have the opportunity to kind of lead a similar legacy as well. Okay. So thank you very much.